Hey, I'm Ferdinand and thanks for checking out the message today. We're glad that you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. As I've said the last few weeks, I'm going to say it again, this is our last uh, Reach, Gather, and Grow. The reach that This is our vision at the River Church. We go over this every year in September and in January just to really talk about who we are, why we do what we do. It's the why we do everything we do. It's really about the gospel, but we want to reach others for Christ. With a, we put this vision circle up on the screen. We want to reach others for Christ. We want to gather together the saints, and we want to grow together in Jesus. Uh, and, that, and, and if you notice there's, there's uh, arrows on there, it's because it's a cycle. We reach the lost, we gather together the saints, we grow in Christ together, and then once you're growing, you go back to reaching because we want others to know who Jesus is. Last couple of weeks, we talked about reach and gather. I um, want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, if you have any questions about any, either of those, uh, why we do what we do, you can go on our, on our app. You can go to our website. Uh, the messages from Lake Orion are, are posted on there, but they're also posted for all the other eight of our locations that we have at the River Church. It's one of the cool things is every, every location pastor is preaching on grow today, but we all have a different take on it. And so you could literally listen to nine different messages on the topic if you wanted to take that much time. They gra- the, the, the links go from 35 minutes to about an hour. Last week, I, was, I almost hit the hour for the first time. Some of you knew that, um, but I hope it was still encouraging. Um, we'll see how we go today. I have more notes this week than we had last week, so... Hang on. Here we go. All right. But today, again, we, uh, we're talking about what it means to grow together in the Lord. And how we live that out of the River Church is really through our growth communities. I can't stress it enough. If you want to connect, you got to get involved in a growth community. I forgot to mention in the announcement time, we also have growth communities for students, for young adults, and for kids. And so please be aware of all those things. We're, uh, th- those things are happening. Again, go to the website, theriverchurch.cc backslash gc, and you can find out what the, when those growth, com- growth communities meet and what they're all about. Um, but how we live that out, again, is in growth communities. But in reality, as we begin this morning, what does it mean to grow? We talked last week when we gathered, there's some things we have to put on, some church clothes we got to put on. This week we're talking about the things that we actually have to take off before we can put on the church clothes. And the only way we can do that is by growing in our relationship with the Lord. So again, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start with verses 1 to 4 where it says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, set Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, for those of us who have been raised with Christ, those people that know Jesus as their Savior, those that have given their lives to Christ, here's the thing. We are called to seek him. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Seek first his kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So we're called to seek the things that are above. But how do we do that, really? Like, how do we actually seek the things that are above? How do we go about doing that? I mean, we're talking about how to grow in our walks with Jesus today. How do you grow in this area? How do you seek the things that Jesus would want you to seek? How do you set your minds on things that are above? The first thing we have to do is we have to recalibrate what our heart's desires are. We've got to recalibrate what our, what our heart's desires are. We set our hearts on so many different things. The reality is we learn most by being around the people that we spend so much time with. What we do with our time calibrates our heart. So think about it. If you spend time with people that are focused on making money at any cost, always talking about investments, what's your life going to be about? making money at any cost, and always talking about how to make your next buck. If you spend time with people that don't have a heart for God, people that don't have any desire to follow him, people that only want what this world has to offer, what do you think you're going to point your life at? Not Jesus. 
you're going to point your life at everything else. If you spend time with people that are going to curse all the time and drink alcohol, maybe do drugs and just are all about having a party and all about just getting rid of all their problems through chemicals, what are you going to do? You're going to be led in that direction. If you spend time, all your time on social media comparing yourself to everything that you see on the screen, you will never be content with who you are and you'll never find who God wants you to be. Your mind will be set on what you're not, not on who God wants you to be because comparison is a killer. I, and I don't understand why we have this disconnect when it comes to our relationship with God. If you want to get to know God, hang out with people that know and love God. You want to improve your marriage? Open your marriage up to people that you, it seems like are getting it right. Go ask questions of them. If you want to be a fan of a football team that has a chance of winning the Super Bowl, come and get to know me. <laughs> if you don't know, I'm a 49er fan. So if you don't know that, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge 49er fan. But the reality is, I want you to hear this this morning. The focus of your life is a direct result of where your mind is set. You got to hear that this morning. The focus of your life is a direct result of where your mind is set. The commentator put it this way. He says, millions of people today think that things are their life. I once saw a poster pictured, which pictured a coffin with pallbearers and the deceased's possessions, a mansion, helicopter, nice cars, including a Ferrari, a Rolls, a Porsche, etc., with the caption, he who has the most toys when he dies wins. For many, this is the philosophy of life. Sadly, many in the church aren't far behind. Theologies com compete brazenly to rationalize wealth, success, and material blessing. This is a quote from Oz Guinness. Prosperity doctrines gush forth from rallies, radio, and television. God's got it, I can have it, and by faith, I'm going to get it. Even Psalm 23 has been revised. The Lord is my banker, my credit is good. He giveth me the key to his strong box. He restoreth my faith and riches. He guideth me in the paths of prosperity for his name's sake. Jesus said something very, very different. In Matthew 6, 21, where he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, the focus of our lives is mainly determined by what our minds are set on. If you want to get to know Jesus better, you have to be around people that love Jesus and are following him. You have to be in the word because this is how we renew our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it's the biggest reason why we have growth communities yet. Are you figuring out why growth communities are important yet? We're going to keep hearing it this morning. Get in a growth community if you're not in one. It's why we place such a big importance on them. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. We see this here. When you come to Jesus, you're securing your life with him and now have the freedom to make a choice to grow in him. And we're going to hear in a little bit how we grow and give you a good picture of what it looks like to grow in the Lord. Let's read verses 5 to 7. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. So we want to start with these. Quite a list. Paul starts with all kinds of sexual sin. The idea of sexual immorality in the first verse, or in, sorry, in verse uh, 5 is the idea, uh, it's the Greek word porneia. It's what we get our word pornography from. Every kind of sexual, immoral sexual relation, adultery, fornication, which is sex before marriage, homosexuality, pornography, and more. Paul is saying, people who follow Christ do not walk like this. Man, I can't tell you enough. I, I was talking to a married couple, or a, a couple that's gonna be getting married soon recently, and one set of parents has been telling them, why aren't you living together yet? And people continue, our culture is talking about living together, living together, living together. That is not the way of the Lord. When you live together, other things follow. And when other things follow, people that love Jesus do not participate in fornication. I don't care what the world's telling us today. We've got to stop it in the church of Christ. We have to. Paul is saying that we used to do these things. We don't do them anymore because we follow Christ. We follow Christ. The next thing he talks about is impurity. It goes further than the physical and to what you're thinking about what you watch, what music you listen to, 
my goodness. I'm not even going to tell you the name of the song. But I was trying to find some music this week for the Oakland Christian Homecoming game in different, like we were, we were honoring alumni. And fi- I was trying to find songs for each decade of alumni. So the 1970 was staying alive because they're still staying alive. Um, <laughs> But, you know, anyway, I, I went through and I had some different stuff going on. And, but when I got to the, like, 2000s to, to today, man, it got hard. It got hard to find a song I could actually play. But, man, there is one song. You may even know if I, I'm not going to describe the song, but it has come out in the last couple of years. It is the most pornographic, evil, terrible song I've ever heard in my life. I listened to about a minute of it, minute of it and I felt like I got it on me. I'm like, oh, I've got to go take a shower. I'm, I'm telling you, our world is just, it, it's out in the open now. Paul says we are not to be like this as followers of Christ. And then he goes to passion and lust. Oh, I'm sorry, I want to go back to impurity. That's also coarse jokes. It's sharing social media things that we shouldn't be posting. My friends, I see Christian posting things that, posting things that make light of sexual immorality all the time. We have to be careful what voice we're using everywhere, including on social media. Then he talks about passion or lust. It's sexual excess and making your life more about sex. That's really what Paul's talking about there. Then evil desire, self-seeking in your lust and sexual desire. Our culture is very depraved this way. It's all about you and getting your needs met when that's not at all what God has to say in his word. Then he goes on, he talks about covetousness. It's interesting that it's listed at the end of these sexual sins. It's the idea of greed, but... It's wanting more than what one should have, specifically wanting what others have. You'll do whatever it takes to get what others have. It's the same lust that was just mentioned, but now it's after material things. We have to remember, whatever we put our trust in, it's what we worship. We have to remember, whatever we put our trust in, it's what we worship. It's what we run after. It can be relationships, sex, prestige, money, what we trust in. We worship, and, and, it, and God tells us that we have to put this off before, before, we, before we can put on these church clothes. And then he talks about how the wrath of God is coming on these things. But these are things we used to be before coming to Jesus. We may struggle with these things, but we have been set free to not do these things. Then he goes on, verses 8 to 10. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, there it is, with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So now he brings up a different list that is now about how you respond to things. Anger, it's this growing inner anger that bursts out of you at different times. It just comes out of you. We had a discussion at our growth community this week. Has anger ever served you well was the question we talked about. And we love to talk about that idea of, well, holy anger. How many times have you actually had righteous anger in your life? Like, honestly. I mean, about the only time we probably ever had righteous anger is when we see slavery in the world. There are more slaves today than there ever have been. And when we know that, that, that girls are getting created, are, are, are getting uh, um, kidnapped, you know, that, that could be a righteous anger. But most of the time, even when somebody has an argument or you see something on Facebook and it gets you riled up, it's not really about some theological thing. It's actually the fact that you're kind of ticked and you feel like you're attacked more than it is a righteous anger. Anger hardly ever serves us well. It hardly ever does. Wrath is the next thing. It's anger that boils over. It's all over everyone around you and you're out of control. It's having a quick temper. Malice. This is anger that turns vicious. It's malignant. It plans evil in the destruction of others. It's vengeful. Getting your pound of flesh, they took it out of me, I'm going to get mine. And some of us struggle with that. Some of us want to get that pound of flesh. Malice, can you say road rage? It turns into that. Slander. See, I think, I really believe slander and gossip go hand in hand. Talking bad about people and maligning them at every chance you get. And I tell you, we're really good at turning prayer requests into gossip. We've got to be careful with that when we share things. We've got to be really careful with our words. And then there's obscene talk. It's filthy language from your lips. This isn't potty mouth, okay? 
This is a term that has become endearing. Oh, it's just, he just has a potty mouth. No, this is, that is not what Paul's talking about here. This is more than hitting your finger and having a momentary slip. This is who or what you actually are and how you speak. Because here's the deal. From the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus said. From the heart, the mouth speaks. And I always find it interesting, though, because I've said this before, and I'm not going to use the golf course thing, but when people are around me and they talk as usual, and I, you know, I'm just, I'm trying not to let them know what I do for a living, because I know as soon as I do, how they've been talking is going to become very, very apparent to them. But the reality is, it's find it interesting. We all say, well, that's just how I talk. That's how I talk. But if you're around, I, I've noticed that when people find out I'm a pastor, their vocabulary changes. And honestly, from my perspective, I'm not going to say, I don't want to say I don't care, but I don't care. I want you to be able to be you. I don't want you to be weird around me. If God hasn't convicted you of that yet, that is what it is, right? It doesn't like offend me and I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't be around you. That's not who, that's not who I am. But people get really weird at that point. But here's the thing. If it's who I am, but I can change it based upon who I'm, whose company I keep, maybe we need to change the company we keep, like we just talked about. Obscene talk shouldn't be coming out of our mouths. He talks about don't lie, don't lie to each other. That's pretty straightforward. It's a sin against the person you're lying to. It's a sin against God and even against the body of Christ. <coughs> because we represent Jesus everywhere we go. And if we're, lying, if we're lying, we're not just hurting ourselves. So Paul says we've got to take, put these things, take these things off in order to put on the church clothes that he wants us to have that we talked about last week. So you can go back and listen to that. But this week, I really wanted to give you a very practical way. How do we take this off? How do we know, how do we find out how to take these things off? Well, again, it's who we hang out with is a big thing. Because for most of us, we hang out with people that, that are going to perpetuate these cycles. Or we're going to go to the websites that perpetuate these cycles. We're going to stay on social media. Or we're going to get into a vacuum, get into a, an echo chamber that's just going to keep us in these cycles. How are we going to break out of it? you got to hang out with people that know the Lord and that want to push you toward him. Some people that will actually get up in your grill and help you because they love you. It's not always easy, but, but it is good. But here's the thing. We have to know this. We talked about this a few weeks ago. You will always do what you feel is most important. You will. You will always do what is most important, what you believe is important. Every single one of us has to stop being a victim of our schedule. You have a choice. You have a choice, every single one of us. The only way you can grow in your relationship with Jesus is to at least be honest with yourself. It's true of any area of life. The only way to grow, to grow is to be honest with yourself. So the question is this morning, do you want to take your next step with Christ? I want to give you a really practical example and an idea to find out how you, where you are in your walk with the Lord and how to take your next step. It's something I alluded to a few weeks ago with these four chairs on the stage, but I'm going to go more in-depth in it this morning because there's many of, some of you have heard me talk about this before. Many of you here have not heard me talk about this before. And I want to make sure that we understand and get a, get a good visual of figuring out how, where we are in our walk with the Lord and where we can go in our walk with the Lord. Because Jesus gave us a pattern to help people take their next step toward him. He gave us this pattern that as we strive to live like Jesus, John tells us in 1 John 2, 6, he says this, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So if we say we live in God, we should be living our lives like Jesus. How do we know how to do that? We look at Jesus. I know that sounds revolutionary, but we got to look at Jesus. We got to look at how he lived his life. This is all a, a process called four chair discipling that's, that was written by Dan Spader years ago. He's the, he's the founder of Sun Life. Good friend of mine, Jay Fass, is a missionary with Sun Life. He, he talks to youth groups. He takes youth groups down to, uh, to Costa Rica. He, he mentors um, youth pastors all over the country. I mean, I've known him for about 20 years. He's a really good friend of mine. And so he and I have had a lot of discussions about this. And I've really tried to internalize it, not only myself, but also as a pastor, anybody that I speak to about discipleship. Um, so this isn't my idea, but it is so, so important to, to think about. 
Well, so the, we have to know that God wants us to grow in him. He accepts us where we are, but he wants us to take our next step. He doesn't want to leave us where we are. He wants us to look more like Jesus. So the question is going to be, what chair are you in this morning? There's, fair, there's four chairs up here. And this first chair is the chair of the lost person. Okay, the lost person, they need to come and see who Jesus is. This chair is the chair of the believer. The believer has to learn how to follow. The third chair is the chair of the worker. They have to learn how to fish for people. And the fourth chair is the chair of the disciple maker. They have to learn how to bear much fruit. And we're going to go into that a little more in depth this morning. But I do want to say this. Sometimes we can look at this stuff and we go, oh, well, it's bad to best. That's not what this is about. This is about finding out where you are. It's not bad to be where you are. It's just where you are. We got to get that out of our mindset. That, oh my goodness, I thought I was in like chair four, but I'm only in chair two. That's actually a good thing to recognize because you got to find out where you are before you can see where you're going. You've got to figure that out. This isn't about bad or better. It's about where you are and where God wants to take you. So get that out of your mind. This isn't a scale. We're not comparing. We're not on social media seeing the perfect picture of somebody that you're not. That's not what we're doing. All right? We're finding out where we are and where God wants to take us. Now, in our world, organizations have a mission statement and a purpose. And they want to produce a specific thing. So what do you think that Taco Bell wants to produce? I was going to say, like, intestinal problems, but <laughs> tacos, yes, tacos, right? How about McDonald's? Hamburgers. We could also say intestinal problems. Um, how about Apple Computer? The best, the best phones out there. All you Android people, pfft, all right. Um, <laughs> I, again, we, we can still be friends. Um, what does the church produce? Disciples. Followers of Christ. Right? You can't do it alone. And in order to know what your next step is, we have to find out where we are so that we can go to the next, next step. All right? So I'm going to get this moved over a little bit. And I'm going to grab my iPad because i got to still have my notes here. And I want to just talk about each chair individually this morning. Chair number one, the chair of the lost. This is the chair of the lost person, the chair of the seeker, right? And this person is somebody who doesn't yet know Jesus. Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Now, I know it may sound harsh what I'm about to say, but I don't intend it to be that. But sometimes I feel like we think that people who don't know Jesus that are lost people are just nice people that don't know who Jesus is. People who are lost are not nice people that just need to pray a prayer. People that don't know Jesus, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, they are dead in their transgressions and sins. They are an enemy of God. That's not me saying that, that's God saying that to us. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. That's why they need to come and see who Jesus is. And people that are in this chair don't yet know what they don't know. They really don't. We can't go in the world today and say, hey, remember the story of Noah? No, most people don't even know who Noah is. If anything, they probably think, oh, isn't Trevor, they probably think of Trevor Noah, who's, who's a dude who's like a comedian, a political comedian, right? I mean, you say Noah, nobody knows who that is. We, we got to talk about God's word in ways that people are going to understand. Because people that are in this chair have beliefs about God that are contrary to his word. They, they might believe in the supernatural that are like is really, really out there. And they may have no belief in the supernatural. They may have a disbelief in God, atheism, or the possibility of God, agnosticism, but you can't know him. Maybe there's many ways to get to God. There's all kinds of things out there today. The thing is, though, as many lost people are still looking for answers, they're just not finding them in truth. They find them all over the world around us. A lot of people think they're too good or too bad for a Savior. I don't need a Savior. I'm good enough. I'm a good person. I do not need a Savior. Other people think they're way too bad. In fact, I bet there's some of us here this morning that, that struggle with thinking that how could God love me? Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. But 
people that are in this, I, 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 like, I, I like saying phrases from the stage. In other words, phrases from the chair. People that are in this chair, you might hear people say things like this. I don't believe there's a God. The Bible is just a bunch of myths. God is just a crutch. There are many ways to get to God. I'm not a Christian because of the way, because of the way Christians act. I don't need to be saved since I'm a good person. I believe in heaven, but there's no hell. These are the kind of phrases you hear. There's no absolute right or wrong. People can talk like that. Or, hey, Jesus was a good guy, but so is Buddha and Krishna. And I just kind of, I kind of like to believe everything because it's not that big of a deal what you believe as long as you believe. These are the kind of phrases you'll hear from somebody that doesn't even know Jesus. It doesn't mean you attack those phrases. It means you're just aware so that, you know. But if you're here this morning and you've said some of those things, my friend, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. No one. And if you ask and call on the name of the Lord today, you can be saved. He will forgive you of your sin because he died on the cross for your sin. He paid for your sin to set you free. And then he rose from the dead on the third day so that you could know him and have a relationship with him. And if you're here this morning and these are some of your phrases, I hope you don't feel attacked. I hope you know and I want you to know this morning, you're welcome. I'm glad you're here asking questions. But this is what we believe about God's word, and I would not be doing what God has called me to do if I did not say that this morning. I want you to know how much you're loved, and I'm so glad you're here asking questions this morning. I hope you come back. I hope you'll be willing to ask questions. We want to be a place where you can belong before you believe. So know that this morning. But that's the people in the the lost chair. And people that are in this chair need to have people that love them enough to come to them and say, hey, come and see this Jesus that I follow. Come and see how he's changed my life. Come and see how much he loves you. Come and see what he did for you. So that's the chair of the lost person. And then we move into chair number two. This is the chair of the believer. It's a chair where Jesus is calling people to say, come, follow me, follow me. Get to know me. Become more like me. People in this chair, when they first become, or when they first accept Christ, they are like a little child. They don't know much. But they're so excited. And I love that. I love when somebody comes to Christ for the first time, and then all of a sudden there's this huge excitement. Jesus' righteousness has been credited to them, and they are now a child of God. But they're in the baby stage of development. They're in the baby stage of their spiritual walk. They're ignorant of spiritual needs. They don't really know about their spiritual needs. They don't know what it's going to take to grow in Jesus. They don't know about what it means to read the Bible or even how to read the Bible. We all have to learn how to do that, and people that first become a believer need to know that. Oftentimes, they still have a worldly perspective about life. They may have some spiritual truth, but there's still some general other things you believe in. Again, maybe this is you. Maybe you're like, man, you know, I'm still figuring this out, and I thought about that, but if it's only Jesus. Maybe you believe in Christ, but there's some other things you didn't know are compatible with that faith. you got to learn those things. You might have pragmatism. You might have questions about what real truth is. The difference between one true God and other gods that are out there. A believer, when they first come to that to, to, to faith, don't understand yet. There's also childlike processes, and they only think about themselves all the time. They're thinking about how things affect them. And people in this stage would say things like this, I believe in Jesus, but my church is in the woods. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I don't have to be in relationship with other Christians. I pray and read my Bible, that's good enough for me. My ministry is my secular work. I don't have time for church. I didn't know the Bible said that. Everyone is a child of God. And on a surface level, some of these things don't sound too bad. But when you look into what the belief is underneath it, those that are believers have to learn how to follow Christ and what that looks like. They've got to learn how to find their identity in Christ. They've got to learn how to walk on their own and feed themselves, right? Right? It's, it's a great thing when your baby, your, your child, learns how to, well, I don't know. Sometimes when they first learn to feed themselves, more food's on the wall than it is in their mouth. But as a parent, you go, oh, they're growing up. That's a cool thing. They take their first steps. Wow, everybody freaks out. How many people, when your child took their first step and they fell over, did you go, oh, my goodness, you're horrible. You took one step. What are you, a moron? And yet, with new believers, sometimes we have this expectation that they should be running when they're learning how to walk. Those of us that have followed Christ for a long time, man, we should be honored that we would get to help anybody come to know Jesus in a deeper level. I don't care where they are in their walk with the Lord. You got to learn how to talk. They got to learn how to feed themselves. 
to be able to get into the word and learn how to do that, to learn how to have a cleansed life. Baby's got to learn how to be potty trained. Young believers got to learn what it means to become more like Jesus, to take off the things we just talked about this morning and to put on the church clothes we talked about last week. Again, super practical this morning, I hope. So you got to learn those things. That's how you get into the next chair. And then you get into chair number three, and that's the chair of the worker. The chair of the worker. Somebody who is now learning how to fish for people. Because spiritual children grow and develop. But there's this weird spot between chair two of the believer and chair three of the worker. And it's a recliner. It's a barca lounger. Because so many people are stuck at like 2.5. If I'd have had time, I'd have brought a, a, a recliner in here this morning and kicked back, but then I might have taken a nap and that would have been awkward. Um, but the reality of it is we sit in this Barca lounger and we're perfectly happy with what we know. We're perfectly happy with where we're at and we're just gonna stay there. And there's some phrases that we might say if we're in this Barca lounger. People would say, I love my small group. Don't add any more people to it. Don't split it up. We don't want any more. I like my group the way it is. No more new people. We create holy huddles that no one else is in, can be invited to. Where are all these new people coming to church? Tell them to leave. You'd be surprised. Some people don't like that. They like what they know. They don't want new people coming. Again, this is that recliner stage. My small group isn't taking care of my needs. I don't have anyone who's spent enough time with me. No one's discipling me. I want things done my way. Yeah. I didn't like the music today. If only they did it like dot, dot, dot. I'm not being fed at my church, so I'm going to go to a church that meets my needs better. What's the theme here? I and me. Yeah. And yet for so many of us, that's where we... That's where, it's easy to settle there because it's comfortable. I got Jesus. I got enough faith. It's affecting my life. But man, I want things my way and I'm going to only think about myself. We serve because we, it makes us feel good, not because that's what God has called us to. Ultimately, in chair three, we've got to figure out what we're engaged in. We're engaged in a game. It's not really a game. But it's, it's a battle between God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and there's God's oppo opponent, Satan, our enemy. And when we get into chair three, we are now working to take back ground from the enemy. We are working to say, look, I'm going to go fish for people. People are dying and not knowing Jesus. It is time for me to go out and fish for people. Romans 323. 323. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6.23. For the wages of the payment of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the message we carry. It is the gospel we take forward. Because there are people that have to be rescued. And in order for them to be rescued, they have to find out who Jesus is. And we carry that name as workers of Christ. But if we're stuck in chair 2.5, people will die and not know who Jesus is. If we're stuck in our recliners perfectly happy with where we are in our walks with the Lord. But we're on a team. It's the body of Christ. We understand we're not alone when we're in chair three. Our directions, our instructions are found in God's word. We have to be in God's word. But you don't want to know what keeps stuff in, or keeps people in chair two and even chair two and a half? It's our stuff. It's the stuff we want to hang on to. Sometimes it's materialism. It's the idols that we hang on to that aren't God. Because it takes guts to get into chair three. Because now we're going to start talking about who Jesus is to the people that we love the most. We're going to start digging into other people's lives because we're called to carry the name of Christ everywhere we go. Because it takes intention. What has to happen in your life, and this is really hard, but what has to happen in your life is we need pruning. We have to go to the vine dresser, Jesus. What did he say? You can bear much fruit when you're connected to the vine, but every, every person he loves, he prunes. He cuts away some of those things in our life so that we can be in chair three. But a person that's in chair three, you know who they look like more and more? Jesus. 
You want to know why we know that? Luke 6.40 says this. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So the question is this morning, for this particular one, who do you look like? That's how you know who your teacher is. Who or what do you look like? Do we look more like what the world is trying to sell us? Then the world is our teacher. If we're beginning to look more like Christ, then Jesus is our teacher. Maybe it's our friends that are our teacher. Maybe it's our family that's been our teacher. Who's your teacher? And those that, 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 are, that are workers, they follow after Jesus. A, they're available. They're available to Christ. They're available to be used for him. They are faithful Man, when, when, they, when those fishermen or when the disciples were learning how to, to fish for people or, or learning how to fish, or Jesus was trying to teach them how to fish for people, they were out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and they had put down nets and they had been out there all day trying to get fish and they caught nothing. And they come over to the shore and, they, and Jesus says, you know what, go back out and put your nets on the other side. All right, you got to understand what's going on here. These guys have been fishermen all their lives. They know what they're doing. And they come to the shore, and there's this rabbi sitting here saying, hey, did you try the other side of the boat? Can you imagine? These guys are like, no, didn't think about that one, Jesus. How many times in our lives do we have situations where we're like, we think we've tried everything, and we feel God's spirit trying to tell us something, and we're like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that one. Or we don't want to try it. Because what happened to these disciples, they actually listened to Christ. They decided to go back out after they had a long, hard day. They went back out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they put their nets on the other side. And you want to know what happened? They had so much fish come into their boats that their boats almost sank. And they get to the shore, and Jesus says, hey, I'm calling you to come and fish for people like this. That's what we're called to do. Sometimes we will preach the gospel and then we don't think there's anything being done. We just sang a song that said he's always working even when we don't see it. Do we believe that? Then we get out of that two, chair two and a half and we get into chair three. And we say it's time to fish for people. A-F-T, they're teachable. We've got to be teachable when it comes to Christ. We've got to be teachable. We can't act like we have it all figured out. Every single one of us has to be teachable. We, we should be enthusiastic. Can you imagine how excited the, 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 those disciples were when all those fish were put in the boat? And they're responsive. They responded to Jesus' call to go put those nets on the other side of the boat, even though they were absolutely exhausted. Some of the things that people in this stage say, they say things like, I love my group, but there are others who need a group like this. I think I could lead a group like this with a little help. Would you help me? I have three friends I've been witnessing to, and this group would be too big for them. Can we split up and I'll lead it? I will lead it. I don't care what it takes. I've got friends that need to know Jesus, and I want to invite them. Man, look at how many people are at church today. This is awesome. I had to walk two blocks just to get here from my parking spot. I don't know that any of us have ever maybe said that, <laughs> you know, even if, it's, even if it's an exciting thing. Man, Randy and Rachel miss group, and I called to see if they're okay. It sounds like their kids have the flu. I'm going to take them some soup this week. I'm ready to make disciples, and I'm going to let you know if I need some help. That's what a worker sounds like. It's no longer just about themselves. Ownership begins in this process. And then we get to chair four. Move to chair four. This is now it's time to bear much fruit. Once you've been in chair three, now it's time to bear much fruit. The major barrier between chair three and chair four is being satisfied. Satisfaction in where you're at. Oh, I'm, I'm telling a few people about Jesus. I'm good. I'm, I'm checking the boxes. It can be really tempting to just check the spiritual boxes in chair three rather than move forward and bear much fruit. We can, be, we can be okay with the fruit we're experiencing, but Christ has called us to bear much fruit. Here's the thing. When we have an overabundance of people in chair three and not any people in chair four, which I will tell you, we did a survey, I'm going to say about five years ago, not at the river, but at, uh, at Gingerville, which is who we were before the river. We did a survey of about 130 people. I think six were actually in chair four. Six people. Because we're not to that point where we're really about, look, 
You don't have to be in full-time ministry to be in full-time ministry, my friend. In fact, I will tell every, I, I, I would pose it to you today, every single one of us is called to full-time ministry. You're in it where you, where you work. God has called me to a specific job in full-time ministry, and it's what I'm privileged to be able to call my career. I'm thankful for that. But all of us are called to full-time ministry. You are the ministers of the gospel everywhere you go. That's what this is about. And when we get into this chair, we bear much fruit. How do we do that? Because this is where it gets exciting. This is where you, get to see, you begin to see God change lives. You ain't changing nobody. It's the Holy Spirit that uses you to change the lives of other people. It's an amazing thing that you get to see. It's an amazing thing that God would even call us to do this together. John 15, 5 says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's the thing. As the chair four person abides in Jesus, because that's how you move from chair three to chair four. You abide in Christ. You live in him. You learn from him. You go after him. You are connected to the vine. You stay with him. And I'm going to put a little side note in there. How do you do that if you're not involved with other believers? I don't know about you, but my goodness, I forget all the time who Jesus is. Because my circumstances become louder than the voice of God in my life at times. I need people to help me remember how much I'm loved. I need people to to help me remember who's on the throne. I need people to help me remember how God wants to use me. I need people to, to remind me that it's not about my talents or my ability, but it's by his strength, says the Lord. I've got to be reminded of that. We all have to be reminded of that because as we, when we get into this chair, we now have a target on our back on the enemy. We need each other in this chair more than we ever have so that we can serve the Lord. We've got to stay connected to the vine and we need to be reminded of that. But this person in chair four helps people in chair one find Jesus, helps people in chair two learn how to follow, helps people in chair three learn how to, fo- how to go fish for people because you're making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Jesus set it up to be multiplication, not addition. Because if you tell two people, those people tell two people, those people tell two people, those people tell two people, oh my goodness, it explodes. Because it's not just about the person in chair four. It's about Jesus. It's never about the person, it's about him. But we have so many people in chair two and chair three because people, we don't get to chair four. We don't abide in Christ. We're not about making disciples. But chair four is an an exciting place to be. You get to be used by Christ in ways you never thought possible because now you're a spiritual parent. What's one of the biggest Marks of physical maturity in humans. Reproduction. That, that, that's when humans, we say they've gone through puberty, right? They're now, on a, they're becoming an adult. That's one of the biggest signs of somebody who's becoming an adult. And yet as Christians so much, we're not reproducing at all. We're not seeing people come to Christ. We're not helping people grow in the Lord. Why? Because we're so worried about our stuff and figuring out how to follow Jesus on our own. Let me tell you this. You don't have to have it all figured out to be in chair four. In fact, people in chair four know for sure that they have nothing figured out. All they know is Jesus and him crucified. Again, this isn't a bad to awesome. Jesus is the only one that's awesome. This is just learning how to grow in your walk with the Lord. Sometimes you're going to have the same struggles you struggle with in chair one and chair four. You just know where to take them. Or you have people in your life that help you take them there. And then in turn, you get to do the same thing. Help people take those things back to Jesus and help people along this process. Listen to this, John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, 
For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. If you are a follower of Christ and you want to follow him with your life, guess what? He's called you his friend. You are a friend of the creator of the universe. How can we not tell other people? How do we not want to get involved with other people? They're going to help us grow in the Lord. Because the characteristics of a friend of Christ and share for, you're intentional. You're going to use the opportunities to be able to talk to people about Christ. You're not going to miss some, but you want to be intentional with your life. You're mission-minded. You want, you're always on mission of Christ. You're going to miss it sometimes, but you want to be on the mission that God has for you in that day. Even that annoying person that came to you, God has an appointment for you for some reason. If it's just to show them some love. I know, sometimes you want to smack them. In the name of Jesus, Right? But the mission is more. Christ is more. Not I, but Christ. He must become greater. I must become less. They're team-minded. They, they know they're part of a, of a team that's, that's moving forward in the body of Christ. And we know how to feed and bathe ourselves at this point. We know that we have to get our, word, our, our meat from God's word. We know how to become clean because we know we take our junk to Jesus we know that he's the one that cleans us. I don't have to clean myself before I, up before I go to him. He accepts me, he accepts me as, I, as I am, and he wants to take me deeper into who he is. And this is what people sound like when they are in chair four. And this guy at work asked me to explain the Bible to him. Pray for me. Someone from our growth community wants to get baptized. When's the next baptism? I want to get them plugged into the church and help them find their next step. Man, our growth community wants to serve the community by mm, this thing. Everyone in the group has a responsibility. We've got it set up. Can we do it? <clears throat> I realize that discipleship happens in the home too. Will you hold me accountable to spending time discipling my children? I have a person in my growth community who's passionate about children. Can you have the children's ministry leader call me? This is people that are in chair four. That's what they sound like. But today, now that we know a little more about what these chairs are, again, not the only way to talk about discipleship, but it's a way that I think is highly effective, helps us find out where we are, what the next step is. So the question that I would really like you to answer today and to think about as we leave today is this. What's your next step in your walk with Jesus? What's your next step? What's the next thing you need to do? What chair are you currently in? Remember what I said at the beginning? In order for there to be growth, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself. If you're lying to yourself, I'm in chair four, yeah, I'm in chair four, but you've never ever led somebody to the Lord, my friend, you're not in chair four. You're just not. That, that's not a, you're not there yet. That's okay to not be there yet, but you can't lie to yourself about it. You've got to be honest with yourself. Why aren't you in a growth community if you're not in one? These are so important. If you're newer to the river, it makes sense that you wouldn't be in a growth community yet. You're still figuring it out. That's why you come to the River Connect class next week. You like what I did there? You come to the River Connect class to find out who we are. Find out if this is your church family. I get it. Trying to, trying to figure out where a church family is, it can be a difficult process. But if you're trying to find a church family, can I encourage you one thing? Finding a church family is not about what the church can give to you. Finding a church family is finding out where God has called you to serve him. Because I don't care where you go. Every church has dust bunnies in the corners, cobwebs in the ceiling, and ugly stuff too because we're all sinners and we're all hypocrites. That's true across the board. And you'll find ours if you're here long enough. But what you got to find out is where God has called you to serve. That's what it means to be a part of a local body of Christ. Do you need to know more about the river? We already talked about that. There's some of you here today that you honestly don't know what your next step is. I get that. Again, for that person, come to River Connect next week. Get involved in these three weeks. Find out. We're going to do spiritual gifts tests in that part too. We're going to try to help you find out how you're gifted, how you can get involved, and talk to you about growth communities. Um, but... I think there's some, too, here today that, that think you don't know what your next step is or you don't think you can make the commitment. Again, I'm going to ask you, you've got to be honest with yourself today. 
Is it because you can't? Or because there isn't enough want to yet? Because again, we have to be honest with ourselves. From my experience, so many of us are living in that Barca lounger in chair 2.5. We're comfortable in our faith. And we have, oh, I'm all busy and I've got all this stuff. You will do what you believe is most important. If you believe that growing in your relationship with the Lord is important, and you believe that growth communities, you're part of this church, you will get involved in a growth community. And you will desire that. Again, you have to be honest with yourself. Stop saying, that. oh, I'm just too busy. No, you're making choices. You're making choices with your life. You cannot grow alone. And you will stay in chair, chair 2.5 or chair 2 until you decide to take that next step. You have to make that choice. You're the only one that can. Because here's the thing. Nothing worth doing is easy. Nothing worth doing is easy. Let me tell you, Jesus is worth it, my friend. He's worth it. He's calling you. He will strengthen you. He will help you. You don't need to do it alone. In fact, you can't do it alone. You can be free. You can be free. Whatever you're struggling with this morning, you can be free. But you have to make that choice to put off these things, put on these church clothes, and get involved. Get into a growth community, I'm telling you. If you try to do it alone, you will flounder. But doing it together gives you a possibility, a probability, the strength of Christ in the body of Christ to not do it alone. You can take your next step. You can. Because he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. The question is, Will you take your next step? Jesus isn't going to push you. The choice is yours. Do you want to grow? Take your next step with him. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. Lord Jesus, we are too easily pleased creatures. We accept so little as though our, just not, just, 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 just knowing you at a surface level so that we get the benefit of not going to hell or being in heaven with you. That, that's all we really want, Lord. But Jesus, you want so much more for us. You want so much more depth for us. You want to see us set free from the chains that bind us. You want to see us in deep relationships with other people that, that are meaningful, that, are, that, that, that push us toward you, that, that help us become more like you. God, I pray this morning that your spirit would help us see where we are. But God, I pray you would help us get a little glimpse of what you see in every one of us as a dad who wants nothing more than his sons and daughters to become all that you've created us to be. Lord, this message has nothing to do with guilt or shame, but it has everything to do with the, the people you've created us to be. If we believe you're a good, good father, then a good, good father wants nothing more than their children to become a fully functioning adult that, that loves you, that follows you, that serves you, that finds their strength in you. And when they are in pain, they would run to you because you love them so much. And you want to comfort us. You want to help us. And you can't wait for the day that we're reunited in full relationship with you in heaven one day we can get tastes of that here on earth and Lord you desire that for us and I pray that today your spirit would speak to our hearts help us to be honest with ourselves about where we are I pray that we would not see this as a value judgment on us or of a value judgment that we think you're placing on us Lord you said we're so valuable that you would die for us so let us never let the enemy tell us that you think less of us you are a good, good father who paid the price so that we can know you. So Jesus, 
Help us to be honest and help us to look to you for the strength that we need to take our next step in our relationship with you. Help us to have the boldness to get involved with other believers, getting into the word and learning more about who you are, asking questions and desiring more of you. Help us to set that as a priority in our lives. Because in reality, one day, a lot of the stuff we do won't matter, but the things we do for you will stand the test of time. Jesus, help us find our next step in you. It's in his name.